So we are on to uh, lecture 25, and uh, we are discussing uh, the oxygen steel making process. Uh, I have already finished uh, you know, discussing and giving you an insight of the LD steel making process, the top blown, and we have also talked about uh, the bottom blowing steel making process, the pros and cons of the it. And now uh, we move on to uh, uh, the last. Uh, part of the oxygen steel making process and I want to discuss today uh, the, the combination blowing steel making uh, process. So, <clears throat> by the end of the day I think I would like to wind up my discussion on uh, oxygen steel making process and move on to uh, the next uh, topic that is the arc furnace steel making combination blowing. process. I deliberately write processes because uh, I am not going to make distinction between the bath agitation process and uh, combined blowing may be looked at like you have both top and bottom blowing and then you have two versions one is through the bottom either you blow oxygen or you blow an inert gas. If you blow oxygen you use coaxial twirls. If you use uh, argon, uh, you use uh, porous plugs. Okay? And I would like to, uh, the combination blowing steel making process with oxygen from top and bottom will have a combined characteristics of, they will share advantages and disadvantages of the top blowing and the bottom blowing steel making process. Uh, uh, yes. And now, <coughs> so that uh, really does not require you know, additional emphasis because we have talked individually the top blowing process as well as the bottom blowing oxygen steel making process. So, you can understand that what will go on uh, you know if you blow top combined if you use combined top and bottom blowing oxygen steel making process. But now we would like to talk about uh, the bath agitation process which is also a version of uh, the combined blowing technique. So, we will apply both uh, top and bottom oxygen blowing steel making technique and then we have, so that is our converter and we have the top lance here, it's the same lance type of lance that one uses in multi hole lance, multi hole water cooled lance and then we have several six porous plugs or 12 porous plugs. Uh, the porous plugs can be as I have indicated, uh, they could be you know organized in different ways. So, this is the 8 porous plug, there could be 12 porous plugs and so on and so forth. Uh, <coughs> with when you inject oxygen with 2 airs, then of course, such an arrangement is rarely used. The two airs are you know located on one half if you draw symmetrical planes. So, you will find either on this side or on this side or on this side or on this side. One side they are basically located on one side of uh, the central plane. Okay? So, and in this case of course, the arrangements could most frequently used are concentric arrangements as I have indicated where I have shown it is not necessary that every converter will use 8 plugs. So, there are different kinds of you know, plug arrangements and uh, these are as I have indicated that a little bit because the bottom in the absence of any bottom stirring as I have been repeatedly saying that the major disadvantage of the LD steel making process is that the reaction dominates in the top phase, but there is nothing you know not much stirring in the bottom part or in the bulk liquid part. So, therefore, a little bit of you know, uh, <coughs> argon, and I say two to three percent by volume of the top gas. If that could be introduced uh, through the porous plug, that can dramatically improve the characteristics of the process itself. So, as I have indicated, that the thermodynamics dephosphorization, desulfurization, or decarburization need not be discussed. Only their rate is going to be different 
you know, depending on the kinetics of the process because the vessel geometry is identical. So, the relative the starting pattern and uh, you know, uh, the starting intensity they are different depending on whether you have a top blowing steel making process, combination blowing or a bottom blowing steel making process. So, we would expect that the kinetics are going to be a little bit of different. For example, if you remember that I have drawn uh, this uh, elemental removal for example in and now you should be able to I do not have to level these diagrams because you should be able to visualize this. So, what is here? Here is the blowing time. So, blowing time is here and I plotted 5, 10, 15, 20 minutes here and then there is a carbon silicon manganese etcetera and then we have shown that if you start carbon and then carbon goes like this and then phosphorus also more or less uh, and the phosphorus scale is a different scale because phosphorus is only 0.1 percent, carbon is 0.15 percent. So, there is a different scale for phosphorus. So, this is the scale for uh, other elements and this is the scale for phosphorus. Okay? And the phosphorus also simultaneous removal and then uh, the phosphorus goes something like this. Uh, we have manganese basically will go something like this and then maybe some. So, this is a top blowing characteristic I have already drawn and if I have to draw a bottom blowing superimpose a bottom blowing car you know only the duration of the time is going to be now that is why deliberately I did not you know, level the time. So, therefore, the carbon characteristics could be you know the decarburization rate could be faster and therefore, we can say that it is more or less like you know that is simple it's going to be some difference in phosphorus because of the you know and then there is a collapse of emulsion etcetera does not really matter. Similarly, manganese con silicon concentration is almost the same in both the processes. So, yellow lines that you see on the board they correspond to the bottom blowing steel making process and then for manganese also as I have indicated this is the plot and then you can see that they are here also somewhere like you know a little bit of pronounced and then possibly this decreasing. So, more or less the same kind of a profile that you are going to get only that is that the duration of the time over which the uh, elements get oxidized that is going to be different. So, there is no substantial difference essential difference between the nature of you know uh, metal ad oxidation either you talk of combination blowing process or still bottom blowing process. So, this is uh, the top blowing and this is uh, of course, this I have not discussed because there is nothing needs to be discussed actually the thermodynamics and kinetics are well known and this is the bottom blowing steel making process. So, BOS basic bottom blowing so this is I would say QBOP that is I think better distinctions and this top blowing or we can say just the BOF basic oxygen furnace or basic oxygen steel making QBOP or BOS you write it with basic oxygen steel making which is the original configuration. So, that is how and similarly here also you will see remarkably the similar kind of you know uh, profiles of uh, how does the elements get oxidized as a function of the blowing uh, time itself. Now, <coughs> In the, I mean you may look at steel making like this it appears that you take a melt which contains pigar, you know carbon etcetera so carbon saturated it contains silicon which has great affinity towards oxygen and you pump in uh, you know oxygen into it. So, it is understood that these elements are going to be oxidized and eliminated and you can make steel. Okay? It appears like that it is a you know there is no novelty in it, but the real crux of the problem in steel making is that while making of steel is easy the question first question one ask is that that can you make it economically or not that is the main issue. Okay? Because you may be you know uh, for example, you may try to take one ton of steel one ton of hot metal and you make steel in such a way that you find that out of this 950 kg of iron which is present in uh, uh, one ton of hot metal 600 tons have landed up in the slag itself that is not the way one can make steel. Okay? Similarly, the final quality of the steel in terms of its you know uh, composition, in terms of its cleanliness, in terms of its microstructure 
whether they can fulfill the requirement of the market, you know, uh, customer or not, these are very important. So the two points which are I think pivots in terms of, you know, uh, the steel making, uh, the engineering uh, in steel making and that is that can we, can we make steel economically, okay, uh, from hot metal and, uh, you know, uh, how and what is the quality of the steel that we are going to make. If your steel is laden with lot of impurities, if your steel contains lot of hydrogen, I mean you apply it in any structure that is going to collapse, okay. So the quality of the steel is of extremely important and the economics of steel making is extremely important and there comes and there you require, you know, a, you know sound knowledge of the process in order to increase the process efficiency or increase the quality of the steel. I would say and we would discuss that when we were students, okay, nobody was talking about, you know, very clean steel and people would be very happy uh, that, uh, you know, even if you have, you know, 150 micron, 200 micron size inclusions, okay. So, and today uh, I think we have requirements where, you know, we require inclusions no more than 30 micron size. Okay, we require a very small population of inclusions, which is a measure of cleanliness of steel. So, what is the microstructure of steel? What is the cleanliness level of steel? You know, these are very important parameters because they determine the performance life of steel. So, in terms of oxygen reacting with carbon and you know el getting eliminated, then the science is pretty well established. Okay, there is no, I mean, no matter how you make steel, the reaction characteristics, the reaction, you know, the nature of the chemical reactions are not going to uh, change, but yes, the way you make steel, the quality of your steel, that is going to have a substantial impact, and that is where actually we are. I mean, today you all know that uh, you know uh, there's a huge pressure on the iron and steel making industry in terms of its uh, greenhouse gas emission. Okay, so we have to. There are many requirements which we have to fulfill and march towards. You know, uh, the carbon footprint of the process has to be increased, and there is a global, uh, you know, effort in order to reduce. You know, the carbon footprint of the steel making process. So, this is one of the challenges, recycling of the material and it is another challenges, challenge. These technologies are fairly well established, okay. So, if you put hot metal and you pump in oxygen, you can make steel, but the end product, whether you have been able to make it economically or whether you have been make a decent quality of steel, that is where the crux of the problem lies, okay. And that is what, that is what we are trying to seek answer by studying iron and steel making. Uh, process per se. So, coming back to this process, so we would expect that in this particular bath agitation process also, we will get, you know, uh, carbs, uh, this elemental removal carbs almost very similar. Only thing is that the duration of the blow could be a little bit smaller, two to three minutes with respect to the top blowing process and uh, uh, top blowing process and so on and so forth. Or the metallic yield may be 1 percent higher, 2 percent higher. So, the kinetic parameters, the performance of the processes are very, very important. So, as I have indicated that uh, in the case of LD steel making process, top blowing steel making process, you had, you know, a sloping incident, you know, which gives rise to yield losses on the, you will, if you go to bottom blowing, there is no yield loss. If you go to combination blowing, okay, and because you are blowing argon here, you do not have to replace, you know, the bottom refractor is not getting damaged because of heat evolved, etc., because there is an inert gas, argon only does the stirring, okay. As the gas rises through the bottom, uh, okay, uh, through the liquid, it induces some kind of a fluid motion in the system, and as a result of which it becomes homogeneous, chances of sloping, etc., is not there. And at the same time, since locally heat evolution does not take place, so the refractory is also not going, getting damaged. So, that distinct advantages, oxygen as such is sub being supplied here from the top, so there is not much need to supply oxygen from the bottom. Our objective is to start this bottom part or the bulk liquid part, which otherwise remains relatively unstarred in just top blowing steel making process and by merely injecting argon through the bottom at a very low fraction, okay, 2 to 3 percent of the top gas volume required amount of stirring can be and that produces decisive advantages in terms of, you know, uh, yield improvement, in terms of refractory performance with respect to BOF process, in terms of, uh, you know, overall uh, process kinetics and bath homogeneity, etc. and so on and so forth. So, I need not discuss this bath agitation processes in any, in any great detail, but I think the, the time has come to see 
that uh, you know the, the performance of the three process that if you take uh, top blowing, you take bottom blowing, uh, I would say that uh, um, combination blowing or bath agitation process okay? and then you have a combina combined combination blowing where we have combined top and bottom blowing, combined top and bottom blowing. Bath agitation, I mean when you use the terminologies are different, combined top and bottom blowing. The blow means, the blowing is argon is not blown per se because the volumetric flow rate of argon is so small. So, we would say argon is injected into the hot metal. Okay? So, blowing gives us you know some kind of an idea that you are blowing uh, at a you know, quite a high rate. So, top blowing, yes, you are blowing oxygen at a very high rate and bottom blowing also if you are putting oxygen will say bottom injection of oxygen is perhaps means it is a you know incipient or a small rate injection. So, that is why uh, I think combined top and bottom blowing sorry uh, bottom blowing and then we have bottom blowing these are the four versions of oxygen steel making process which are by the way extremely popular. Uh, throughout the world and as I say that this and this constitute the major chunk of the processes. Uh, if you compare the performance uh, of these processes and I would say that we have you know th this is the first steel making process which was uh, which first version of the oxygen steel making process this is the top blowing steel making process or the BOF steel making and then came all these versions one after another you know either in Europe and in North America and if you say that if you have to do in a scale of 1 to 10, 1 essentially is poor on a relative scale. Okay? We are comparing, it is not a global comparison, it is a comparison between the four kinds of portions of oxygen process and 10 is very good. If you consider this, we can say that there could be several parameters. One is that parameter I would say is that uh, FeO content of the slag, percentage FeO in slag, first bracket essentially indicates slag and we would say that uh, this is you know 1 here and this is 10 here. The bath always remains, this 10 does not mean by the way that there is you know I mean there is no, no FeO versus there is all FeO, it does not mean so, it only says that the FeO content, FeO is going to be there in a, any steel making process, oxygen steel making process or any steel making process where you have an oxidizing environment, FeO is going to be there, it is going to be an inherent you know integral constituent of the slag. So, the question is how large is that content? So, in the case of top blowing the oxygen you know FeO content could be very high and how high? This could be something about 20 to 25 percent. On the other hand, this could be somewhere around 10 percent or so. Significant savings and this essentially tells we have more retention of the metal in the uh, liquid phase itself and they are intermediate. So, combined top and bottom blowing I would say that they both will be somewhere you know very close to this. So, this you can and a tap carbon content, this information is typically available in the literature. If you plot it FeO and then you plot it tap carbon, tap carbon means when heat is over and you are going to take the metal out of the furnace, that operation is called the tapping operation, which we are going to now discuss. Tap carbon and the curves are shown to be like this. This is uh, there are four. And this is, uh, if you say this is my A, this is my B, this is my C and this is my D and then this is like A, B, C and D. And you can see that the car moves in these directions, okay? A and we say 0 percent top blown gas, bottom blowing gas that is what it is. 
within bracket whatever is the parameter this essentially says the component of bottom blowing gas. Okay. On the other hand B I would say this is about bottom blowing gas is 0.1, this is about 1 and this is about 5 and what are the units? The normal meter cube per ton per hour, normal meter cube per ton that is the unit, same unit is there. <coughs> and so, as we increase the bottom blowing gas, the iron oxide content, the system is now much more closer and as a result of which the dissolved oxygen contents are dramatically different, 600 and it could go up to 300 and this could be somewhere around 350 in the range of I will put you know 300 to 400, similarly here also 300 to 400 and this is percentage of your now this I would say oxygen ppm. I would say yield loss improvement with respect to A. So, this is 0 and this is 1 percentage yield improvement, yield loss improvement and these are going to be somewhere in between half something like this, that is the range. I would say sloping incident, sloping, I will put this is poor, so sloping score here is this means frequent, these are rarely And this is perhaps never. And this can and bath mixing, if you talk of bath mixing, again with respect to A, bath mixing improvement with respect to A, then you would say about 90 percent homogeneity is there, and here I think it is 50 to 70 percent. improvement in bath mix, mix, mix mixing with respect to A, this is 0. So, this now tells you that of course, the economic parameters are not shown here. For example, the lining maintenance, the two-year life etcetera has not been shown here, but this gives you a very good idea that you know shifting from top blowing to bottom blowing uh, combination uh, bath agitation process. Okay. The cost of argon is also important vis-a-vis uh, -vis the cost of oxygen. Okay. So, all these parameters if you take into account uh, the refractory life, the yield loss etcetera, uh, this appears to be uh, a great proposition you know for new steel makers, oxygen people who would like to adopt oxygen steel making you know to go for uh, bath agitation process. The scenario may change okay, uh, depending on uh, the research that we are conducting of course. So, I think uh, I understand to, to me it appears uh, that you know most of the future choices of still making oxygen still making process per se will be you know between B and C because of the obvious advantages that they offer you know uh, with current emphasis as I have been saying. Uh, that people would like to have you know uh, more frequently bath agitation process rather than the combined top and bottom blowing steel making process and I think the table speaks volume uh, in favor of the bath agitation uh, process. In the oxygen steel making process, we have seen that because of use of oxygen, uh, the rate of reaction is extremely fast, the kinetics of reaction is extremely fast. So, Therefore, there is not much time for manual intervention, you know, in terms of uh, monitoring the composition, etcetera. How does the temperature that you know 
somebody will come and these are very you know uh, uh, what do you call uh, cumbersome uh, places to work in in terms of the hostility of the environment uh, because of high heat hazardous environment you know smoke and dust uh, of course the plants today are far more cleaner than they used to be you know a few decades back uh, thanks to our extreme you know um, the redusting systems in this is you know uh, gas clean, gas cleaning apparatuses that we have built up or the gas cleaning plants. Uh, so, the suspended particles in steel plants today uh, are substantially more smaller than they used to be you know say 30, 40 years back. But despite that, that these are high temperature reactors you know uh, yeah. <coughs> heat radiation, uh, radiation effects are very predominant. So, they are not qu quite good site to conduct uh, any trials uh, or measurements manually and that uh, the duration of the blow itself is very very small the reactions are rapid you really have very little opportunity uh, to do things manually here. So, that is why uh, we have you know uh, quite a bit of uh, automation and process control. Uh, these converters you know they are quite you can imagine 300 meter you know 300 a ton converter. So, I mean somebody would go and immerse some you know probe to measure, he, he will not realize that where the probe is sitting and so on and so forth. So, approaching these converters could be uh, you know <coughs> uh, very, very difficult. I remember uh, that when I was a student uh, you know uh, and Tata still used to have uh, the Bessemer converter. Uh, I came to this know the story that you know the operator used to be so experienced that he could look at the flame uh, which is coming out those days of course, today nothing comes out of the converter mouth. Okay? So, everything is in a you know uh, connected uh, with a huge hood and suction devices to a gas cleaning plant, but good old den days uh, we used to see the flames coming out of the BOF converter which also used to look more or less similar uh, some without the. Uh, top lungs then then the Bessemer converter of course, is two air through which air has been injected. But the operator would observe the flame here because carbon monoxide would burn, carbon monoxide produced as a result of carbon oxygen reaction would burn at the mouth of the converter producing carbon dioxide and that is how uh, you know that burning relative proportion of carbon monoxide and carbon dioxide really uh, gives rise to a change in the flame color that of course, may not be easily discernible to people like you and me, but a person who is experienced you know in handling such a system for a long period of time, he can looking at the flame itself tell that what is the state of oxidation of the bath. Okay? But there is an empiricism involved there, there is a chance of getting error and in a process you know in a competitive world modern world like this you cannot rely on such uh, empirical or you know subjective processes anymore. So, we have now in place uh, automation and process control facilities uh, of which on a routine basis you know monitor the progress of the blow and take a hit from its beginning uh, to the end. So, it is still making oxygen still making without uh, process control you know equipments and uh, uh, models uh, are cannot be imagined cannot be imagined. So, uh, we we have you know many paraphernalia attached to an oxygen steel making converter in order to steer a particular blow that when the lens is to be lowered at what rate the oxygen flow rate is to be used, what should be the gradual decay increase etcetera or change in the oxygen flow rate into the system, when lime is to be added all these things are planned well ahead and also do as the blow evolves. If they are flow you know in that regard we have many equipments as I said. and models that we run, equipments or devices we can say and models which we. So, this are uh, with respect to I would say process control, how to control the process. And these are for example, as I have indicated we have a sub lance that sub lance <coughs> can dip into the molten metal it is a retractable lance. So, that sub lance can measure 
temperature as well as the composition of the bath okay, in terms of its carbon, etc. So, similarly, there could be load cells which could be attached, which can tell us that how much of material is sitting there. There could be accelerometers attached to the converter because we are injecting supersonic jet and there is a huge amount of vibrations. So, you know, the, those, so accelerometers could be there to, you know, those vibrations could be related to the kind of jet, jet metal interaction or the amount of oxygen flow rate, etc. There could be pressure monitoring gauge, there could be flow meters, many kinds of equipments are uh, attached. Uh, to an oxygen still making converter today in order to control the process itself. Now, there are, there are models also and this kind of models that we use, for example, I have, a, I have stage is a static model and dynamic model. Or this you can say the static models are offline models. You can run this model sitting in your laboratory and dynamic models are online models and they could be feedback uh, control, you know, based on feedback control. For example, I would say that, you know, if, if you and this is <coughs> an equipments one, I have also, you know, there is off gas control, off gas composition measurement device, which is also very composition. Then you have can have, you know, refractory here, some temperature measurement, tempcon, this is a thermocouple inserted to find out that what is the state of, uh, you know, heating of the refractories, etc. <coughs> temperature of measurement. So, all these equipments and you know when you have a dynamic control model, these models are feedback control. So, which, what generates the feedback? The feedbacks are generated from the sublance output, the feedbacks are generated on the basis of the off gas composition and then they are put into the model based on which the oxygen flow rate is going to be adjusted, the lance you know uh, height is going to be adjusted and so on and so forth. So, these are online model. Within the progress of the blow, oh, dynamically controlled, mes several measurements of temperature, pressure, concentration, etc., which are going to be made and there are what the parameters, operator has only two different parameters. He can either, you know, raise the height of the lance or he can change the blow rate of the oxygen. There is no third variable in front of him as the blow starts. And these two parameters, okay, uh, you know, by maneuvering these two parameters, the operator gradually and smoothly takes the blow from the start to the end with a precise control of the end point itself. Okay, so for example, as the end point approaches, you know, where should be the lance? What should be the flow rate? And how does the at what rate the end point is approaching? These are all going to be based on feed point. You know, you have a decarburization model based on that. You have made some calculations already, and you. You, know, you understand that what is your carbon content and what is your target carbon okay? and that way you precisely know that what is the time at which you are going to reach the desired carbon and at that particular point maybe you will you know, stop the oxygen blowing, you will stop the oxygen blowing and retract the lance itself. So, all these things are going to be done uh, based on dynamic model that you will steer for dynamic models are to steer the blow okay? from beginning to the end. On the other hand, static models, for example, I would say, uh, which are based on, you know, uh, material and heat balance, uh, they are basically done offline, and their utility is that you say that uh, I have, uh, you know, I know the hot metal composition. Uh, so the hot metal; these are basically charge control, I mean the static models are basically charge control models. It uh, calculates, uh, it's a, these are basically materials and enthalpy balance models. So, it tells you, you know, in an offline fashion that if you want to produce, for example, you, you tell me that I want 
one ton of hot metal to be produced, one ton of steel to be produced and my steel would contain 0 0.05 carbon, no silicon, okay, uh, maybe 0 0.5 percent uh, manganese, okay, and <coughs> I, you know, some phosphorus 0 0.008 phosphorus, these are, these are my requirement roughly. So, you can imagine it is 5, uh, almost 99.5 weight percentage is iron, rest are the 3 impurities that we have. That is my target. My customer has asked, so I want to produce that steel. The question now is that if I want to produce 1 ton of steel, what should be the amount of hot metal that I should be charging? You can understand that if you if you think of if you an idealized process, so whatever iron you have put in if you in input, that iron manifests in Fe or I would say if in hot metal and if that is in steel and plus Fe in slag because slag will always contain. You must understand that for Fe in slag I do not know okay. uh, how much of Fe because the slag will contain FeO and corresponding to that weight percentage FeO there is going to be some amount of Fe and the Fe which is there in the slag plus Fe within the metal and that will give rise to hot metal. So, I do not know, for example, you may say that well I have studied thermodynamics well and I know that I have to have a V ratio is, is equal to 3.5. You can also do a thermodynamic analysis and find out that corresponding to this carbon and if you say that my steel making temperature I will try to get there, reaching there is not so easy, you cannot do it arbitrarily. Okay. You have started with a hot metal which is 1450 degree centigrade, you are going to add so many cold things into it like limestone scrap etcetera okay. and you are assuming that you will get to a temperature of 1600 degree centigrade to support the subsequent processes or steer through the subsequent processes beyond the primary steel making. So, this is your target temperature and this is your target composition and now if you say that you want to have uh, you know. V ratio of 3.5 from your thermodynamic knowledge. From your thermodynamics at 1600 degree centigrade, you will be able to find out that what is the equilibrium oxygen content of the bath that you should be able to find out. You should also be find out assuming slag metal equilibrium is there and you must understand now if your bottom blowing steel making process, your these calculations are going to be closer to the reality because the bottom blowing oxygen steel making process operates closer to the equilibrium. If you do it, you know, so there th these are some sort of idealizations are there. So, it, the calculations that you are going to do are not going to exactly match with the expectations or the reality. Similarly, percentage of you on the basis of equilibrium in the slag can also be calculated if you assume that there is CO if you equilibrium, slag metal equilibrium is there then I have shown you that what percentage of carbon multiplied by what percentage of FeO in slag is, is equal to 1.25. So, you should be able to. So, all these parameters can be thermodynamically calculated. If you know V is equal to 3.5 that you have found out that that is a slag that will remove the phosphorus okay? uh, and now you will know that look if you assume you know that all the silicon whatever was there in the hot metal itself have completely oxidized and that we have seen from the elemental removal curves that from the first 3 minutes itself almost all the silicon is gone from the metal. So, you will know that you have charged 1 ton you, you know you want to produce 1 ton of hot metal and amount of hot metal if you say this that this is amount of hot metal and which you do not know okay, but you should be able to find out 
that for this amount of hot metal, okay, how much of silicon is going to be there as a function of WHM. Okay? If 4 weight percentage of silicon is, you know, 1 weight percentage of silicon is there in the hot metal, so you will understand that in 100 kg, 1, you know, 100 ton, 1 ton of silicon is there. So, in so many tons of hot metal, how many tons of silicon is going to be there? So, corresponding to that, how many tons of silica is going to be produced? And 3.5 times of that amount of silica is going to give you the total amount of lime that needs to be charged into the process. So, by performing elemental balance, by knowing the process, by knowing the thermodynamics okay, and taking into account the heat liberated because of various chemical reactions, you should be able to find out all the parameters that in order to produce 1 ton of steel okay, for a given grade of hot metal. The grade, hot metal as it comes from the blast furnace, the composition will be known to me, but how much I have to charge in the furnace is not going to be. So, the hot metal composition is known, you must understand. For a given hot metal composition to produce 1 ton of steel, how much of hot metal needs to be charged? How much of lime needs to be charged? What is the slag volume which is going to be generated? What is the percentage of FeO which is going to be present in the slag? What is the net temperature, which, you know, heat which is going to be evolved in the system? Okay? All these things can be calculated by simply considering plugging in, you know. Uh, from thermal chemistry books as well as from relevant thermodynamic you know chemical equilibrium data uh, which are available in standard text for example to calculate this sort of values and you will be able to find out all these parameters. Uh, so, you have now what you have you have planned the heat as far as the material and heat is concerned and you are you can put a paper based on your this material balance and heat balance that you can say that I for one ton of steel to be produced from this grade of hot metal, charge this mass of hot metal, okay, 1.6 tons or 1.3 tons, charge 400 kg of lime or 500 kg of lime and all these parameters you should be able to tell and you can say within plus minus 5 percent or 2 percent, you know, these values are going to be uh, observed during the experiments itself. So, you have produced a certainty band of your calculations also and that sensitivity you can study always by considering. Uh, data from different sources that what is the kind of variations that your predictions can make. And all interestingly, these all calculations you can sit down and do it. You have nothing to do with the oxygen steel making process. You are far away sitting in your laboratory planning off the heat. So, on a daily basis when you make different grades of steel, sometimes carbon steel, sometimes alloy steel, for all those in an offline fashion, the char, you know the heat is to be planned that what is uh, you know what should be the raw material, what should be their composition or what is the composition available, you know what is the total amount of oxygen requirement. For example, you can say that oxygen requirement in this particular process, how, where does the oxygen gone? The oxygen has gone to oxidize carbon to carbon monoxide, silicon to silicon dioxide, Mn to MnO okay, and oxygen dissolved in metal. So, this is the source of the oxygen. So, you can perform a material balance equation because I know the hot metal composition required is 0 0.5 and I know the initial it is 4.5 or 4.3. So, how much of carbon has been oxidized, how much of corresponding CO has been generated can be easily calculated. Okay? And by performing these material balances, you know, uh, the stoichiometric calculations, you will be able to find out that what is the total oxygen requirement of the process. But the calculation will not tell you in how you have to blow the oxygen. Should you blow all the oxygen, you know, within 5 minutes or you should follow a sequence that information is not available here. These are purely thermodynamic calculations. It can only give you the values, okay, the, because the thermodynamics talks about the initial state. It does not give you the path. So, therefore, no information on the blowing strategy, etc., can be obtained from this. But nonetheless, these calculated static models are very, very it can be a crude model and you know when we will solve the problems you will see that for certain simplified situations I will demonstrate more elaborately that how one can uh, really apply material balance and plan a heat, but one can make a sufficiently rigorous you know and elaborate uh, model such that they are you know they accurately replicate or reflect uh, uh, the charge uh, and the process and uh, particular heat in an uh, basic oxygen steel making converters and this as I have indicated again and again that this could be done sitting in the laboratory far away from the melt shop 
and that is why these models are called offline. So, even before the furnace is tilted and you know the operator knows that uh, the next heat is at 10, 10 o'clock, 10, 15 past 10 and he has a sheet of paper in front of him which has come from the control laboratory and which tells him that you know for this particular heat he is going to make this grade of steel and these are the materials which he need to charge. He does not have to apply any mine. Okay? All these things have been drawn out or calculated on the basis of static models which are available you know, with most of the steel melt shop and particularly in the control room. So, today, so entire heat in an oxygen steel making process or on all the heats in oxygen steel making plants uh, are uh, you know, manually, first manually planned and the blow is assisted by dynamic various kinds of dynamic models okay? and there are different models which of course is not in the purview of the course. Uh, so, I will not be able to tell you anything only perhaps I can tell is you know given that information that based on output from the converter in terms of temperature, in terms of concentration, in terms of, in terms of gas concentration, in terms of the melt composition etcetera uh, you know uh, the two parameters oxygen blowing rate uh, as well as uh, the lance height etcetera uh, because when the blow goes on uh, he cannot the operator cannot change the lance okay the lance is fixed okay it is a six hole lance or four hole lance only two parameters are there with which how he has to play and that is going to be guided by the dynamic uh, model. So, if you want to study there are you know uh, you can study dynamic models there are enough literature available. Uh, so, I think I will not discuss uh, any further the last point that I want to tell you is that there have been many developments which have taken place apart from you know uh, this process controlling part in terms of getting uh, improved uh, furnace performance and two important uh, fronts on which we have seen is the lining life of the converter okay? that is a very important parameter. So, we have we have process control models uh, and as I have indicated somewhere that uh, uh, you know sometimes that you do not see anybody in the melt shop actually these days. Uh, every steel LD converter you know or top oxygen steel making converter is associated with a huge control room where you have consoles which you know through which you can visualize the process the charging inside of the furnace all these things you know you can see on the screen itself you do not have to get exposed to uh, the high thermal um, high temperature you know uh, radiation uh, in any case and in those control rooms you have you know control models etcetera uh, available to you. So, that is one part of the development which is which goes in terms of maneuvering the process uh, as accurately as possible. Regarding improvement in the converter life because you see if the converter uh, we have we fabricate the converter to make steel. So, it is desirable that uh, the converter must be able to turn around in a very short amount of time or if you know if our, the relying need not be too frequent if you know every month the converter needs relining in that case we are in big problem. Okay? So, the converter usage of the converter is very very important for us and that necessitates that the lining must be very high quality lining it should be protected, but it is easy said because the temperature here is more than 1600 degree centigrade and there is going to be wear and tear of the refractory and as a result of which what happens the converter life can get drastically affected. I mean we have converter life the enormous range you know from 2000 hits to about 20000 hits that is the range of converter life. That means, it can after 2000 hits I mean here from on a hit to head basis there may be some repair which may be necessary okay, of the working lining I am not talking of that, but after 2000 this figure shows that after 2000 heat you know the converter is taken away. You know, there is extensive relining work is to be done. On the other hand, there are industries which, which uses you know uh, superior quality refractories and also have certain you know uh, adequate control uh, or strategy in order to <coughs> have uh, significantly higher lining life. So this is lining life range. So you can imagine that if you know if you are making uh, say for example. Uh, 20 hits a day. So, this essentially 
uh, indicates that after 2000 hits, so it's every 100 day, a relining is necessary and this essentially implies that every 1000 day. So every three months as opposed to three years, that's what is the ratio of relining and you can have a parameter which we call as a refractory consumption. So how much of refractory has worn out? So you can divide it by 100 and then you can say that you know refractory consumption in the steel making on a daily basis and this is a very important parameter as far as economics of steel making is concerned. I mean in the steel making industry the refractory consumption per day on a daily basis is going down and down and down because of not only improvement in the quality of the refractory but also in the improvement uh, of our uh, blowing strategy particularly with respect to or the, you know uh, the educate steps that we have been able to take in order to ensure good line of life. One such step is called uh, the slack splashing technique. Basically what happens is that once the blow is over then the slag is you know metal is taken out and uh, slag is also taken out but a little bit of slag is from the heat is left and then if the lance is lowered here okay uh, if the lance is lowered here and you have you know some sort of a slag which is left from the beginning. So what one can do, one can blow the gas and in this case do not blow, it is not oxygen which is blown, nitrogen is blown and then it causes the slag material to flow in the reverse uh, direction. So, so how much amount of, so as a result of which what happens is this refractory which is you know uh, in contact with the bath particularly and it can really get coated by a layer of uh, uh, slag material and this can work because slag is what? Slag of course contains some iron oxide which is not quite good but some kind of a protection the slag before the slag dissolves you know away or moves away uh, that it will take some amount of time for the lining material to get exposed to the melt by the time half refining is going to be over. So it is easy the way I have demonstrated it but it is not so uh, easy to be done in practice so some you know uh, kind of an expertise is needed in order to ensure an uniform coating of slag and there are nozzle designs etc which people use okay, uh, uh, in order to ensure that there could be uh, adequate or appropriate uh, slag coating on the refractory for enhancing uh, the life of the refractory material in the system. So <coughs> this is a very important technique and the improvement of lining life from 2000 to 2000 the slag splashing has played a very important role and most of the converters have showing good quality of you know refractory life really relies on slag splashing technique. It is sufficient for you to know that yes you know you can code the refractory because there is going to be high temperature sintering the moment the slag, slag may be semi fluid. This is solid temperature is still smaller okay it has started to cool off because you have started to drain and as a result of which what happens when you code the slag the slag flows past the refractory moves up because of the impinging action of the impinging gas jet you know it causes the slag to flow radially and then it gradually rises and then what happens is the slag gets sintered on the refractory surface these are all oxide materials uh, so they are they have natural affinity in order to establish bonds among them and that creates the slag splashing uh, and that is how the slag splashing ensures a better life of the refractory. The other important aspect of uh, LD converter is uh, the post combustion and that is also used in order to <coughs> ensure uh, that uh, you know uh, we the thermal uh, efficiency of the process is significantly more. I have given you the values of carbon to carbon dioxide oxidation you know that value 395,000 kilojoules per mole of carbon. On the other hand, I think uh, I have given you the value of carbon monoxide which is about 114. So significant amount of energy can be harnessed by oxidizing carbon monoxide to carbon dioxide. But if the carbon monoxide and this is not you know you have hood here and these hoods are not per se airtight. So atmospheric oxygen gets 
ingressed here and as the gas flows up the oxygen gets in here okay because of the local low pressure region here uh, the gas is moving up huge volume of carbon monoxide gas and here uh, the carbon monoxide can burn into carbon dioxide itself. So, this sensible heat uh, uh, sorry chemical heat of carbon monoxide to carbon dioxide oxidation if that could be harnessed properly in that case what happens is you can have a higher melt temperature. Of course, you may say that sir higher melt temperature will damage my refractory that is absolutely right, but I am going to use that at a higher temperature in order to add little bit more scrap into the process so that my final temperature remains 1600 degree centigrade or not. So, there are you know auxiliary nozzles etcetera injecting air producing carbon di monoxide to carbon dioxide or carbon dioxide within the furnace itself. So, you inject oxygen in the upper part of the converter mouth then carbon monoxide gets oxidized to carbon dioxide the heat is being liberated you know then it is advected back through another kinds of gas injector ok. So, you have oxygen supplier these are called secondary uh, or atmospheric injectors. these are called atmospheric injectors and these atmospheric injectors actually are used to combust oxygen and there may be a secondary stream ok which would be you know move directed in such a way. So, the heat can be convected heat as such is going to be radiated in all directions, but we do not want heat to be radiated to the refractory we do you know because that is going to take place in every direction. So, if by convection you know if this heat can be directed predominantly to the liquid surface in that case the liquid can absorb more amount of heat the temperature can go up and as a result of which more amount of scrap can be accommodated. So, the yield I you know I have, have 4 or 5 different furnaces. So, little bit of less hot metal I can take and make the heat by using more additional amount of scrap into the process itself which are generated steel plants tend to generate huge amount of scrap ok. Because of sometimes rejection sometimes necessity we will see for example, when we talk of you know the little metallurgy and tundish metallurgy huge amount of skulls are generated and those are have to be recycled back and a potential site for recycling is here and you can accommodate more amount of scrap here provided you know you have uh, processes like post combustion facilities in the furnace itself and electric arc furnace because where you use uh, uh, external electricity which is very expensive post combustion is a very important aspect of the uh, thermal efficiency or the process efficiency of electric arc furnaces. So, here also modern furnaces try to use some not all, but some post combustion heats and thereby consume uh, you know uh, make an avenue for the consumption of more scrap in the process uh, improving the metallic yield for a given amount of hot metal input to the furnace itself. So, there are diverse amount diverse kinds of developments which have taken place as far as process control is concerned enhanced refractory life is concerned harnessing of uh, <coughs> heat through post combustion is concerned and all these effects are known to ensure that on a raw you know on a sustained basis the same quality of steel is produced with the target composition that I have listed or you know desired target composition on a sustained basis you know the economics of the process becomes higher and higher and all these kinds of developments have taken place in the last 30 40 years uh, which makes you know uh, the LD uh, the oxygen steel making process extremely competitive and economically cheap. So, no steel making process you know it is very difficult for any other steel making process to the volume because the volume it can churn the converter sizes are very high very big 300 500 tons it are connected with liquid dust furnaces. So, you know uh, although the capital expenditure for, for an integrated steel plant is very very large but the rate at which metal is produced or the cost of production per ton it is you know uh, in integrated mill uh, is, is, is significantly smaller than the cost of production in uh, other kind of steel plants like an arc furnace based steel units and so on and so forth. So, it is in the foreseeable future uh, it is you know uh, replacing entirely of course, there is going to be pressure on us uh, in terms of you know improving carbon credit etcetera. But you know to, to totally you know um, eliminating blast furnace iron making route <coughs> of iron steel making uh, you know is perhaps impossible uh, at least 
you know, in the foreseeable near future. And this is going to remain as a dominant uh, technology of steel making uh, in the world for years to come. So with this, I think uh, I will know not further discuss any more oxygen steel making. And next two lectures, I will talk on electric arc furnace steel making, and then go on to you know uh, talk about uh, the tapping operation, deoxidation, and little metallurgy steel making. Okay, thank you.